Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at washingtech.com forward slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Moving the needle. Welcome to the Washington Tech Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washing Tech Policy Podcast Policy with Podcast. Joe Miller. Anonymous claims to have released Donald Trump's private info. NSA reportedly declined Hillary Clinton's request for a secure device. And John Bergmeier is my guest. The hacking collective Anonymous has apparently released a can of you-know-what on Donald Trump. Last week, Anonymous announced they were unleashing an attack on Trump's data, inviting the public to join in. On Friday, hackers claiming to be part of Anonymous posted what they said were Trump's social security number, phone number, and other personal information. Trump's campaign announced law enforcement officials are investigating and planning to make an arrest. Trace William Cowan has more over at Complex. Michael Bicekler at Talking Points Memo reported on some documents that the conservative advocacy group Judicial Watch uncovered. The documents show Hillary Clinton's staff requested a secure government cell phone, but NSA denied it back in 2009. The presidential candidate began using private email accounts about a month later. Recall that Clinton has been under unrelenting fire for the security risks posed by using a private email service to conduct official State Department business while she served as Secretary of State. Donald Reed, Assistant Director for Safety Infrastructure, said that after repeated attempts to secure a secure device for Clinton, NSA essentially told them to, quote, shut up in color. But it turns out former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice received a waiver and was provided with a secure device, no problem, while she worked for former President George W. Bush. NSA said they phased out those waivers due to security concerns. Check out Talking Points Memo for more. The U.S. Senate has unanimously voted to hold classified ad website Backpage.com in contempt because the company did not comply with a subpoena to turn over documents showing how it prevents sex trafficking. The site has been accused of facilitating sex trafficking of adults and children. Counsel for Backpage Stephen Ross at Aiken Gump released a statement saying the investigation attempts to impede Backpage's free speech rights. This is the first time the Senate has held someone in contempt since 1995 when they were investigating then-President Clinton's connection to Whitewater real estate. Yaoda Soros of the U.S. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children says reports of suspected child trafficking is up 846 percent since 2010. Dustin Voltz at CNBC has more. YouTube has signed on to T-Mobile's Binge On service, a zero rating service which allows T-Mobile subscribers to now access YouTube user content without it counting against their data caps. More than 50 services have signed on to Binge On, including Discovery Go, Fox Business, and Red Bull TV. Stay tuned for my interview with John Bergmeier at Public Knowledge for more on zero rating. Some activist shareholders of Amazon, Arjuna Capital, have submitted a proposal for Amazon and other tech companies, including eBay and Intel, to report on what it's doing to close gender pay gaps. The company has reported in the past that women comprise just 39% of Amazon's total workforce and 24% of the company's managers. But Amazon has resisted the proposal, saying it is vague. However, the Security and Exchange Commission last week issued a ruling saying it disagreed with Amazon, ensuring the proposal will appear on Amazon's annual ballot. Tribune Publishing is trying to take over California. 
The Department of Justice is suing the Block Tribune Publishing from buying the Orange County Register and Riverside Press Enterprise, which recently filed for bankruptcy. Tribune currently owns the L.A. Times, Chicago Tribune, and the Baltimore Sun, among others. Just a few hours before the DOJ sued, Tribune had won a $56 million bid for Freedom Communications, the Irvine, California-based company that owns the Orange County Register Excelsior in Santa Ana and the Press Enterprise in La Prenza. The Senate has unanimously passed a Freedom of Information Act FOIA reform bill, which would give the public better access to public documents. If passed, the provisions of the new law would include requiring agencies to show a foreseeable harm when they refuse to release documents and create a single portal for FOIA requests, as opposed to the separate process for each agency that we have today. The Obama administration had actually lobbied against FOIA reform, with the Justice Department saying the changes to FOIA were not necessary. Finally, The Verge reports that Spotify has settled to pay some $21 million in back royalties to the National Music Publishers Association for tracks included on the service that contained inadequate copyright owner information. $16 $16 million will go to publishers and songwriters. The remaining $5 million will go to a bonus fund that artists and songwriters would be able to opt into. Stay with us. For you, my dear listeners of the Washington Tech Policy Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day free trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You'll be amazed at how much time Audible will save you. Why not listen at the gym, in the car, or on your morning run? How about start with why? How great leaders inspire everyone to take action by Simon Sinek. You can download Start With Why or another audiobook free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and 30-day trial today at washingtech.com forward slash book. My guest today is John Bergmeier, Senior Staff Attorney at Public Knowledge, specializing in telecommunications, internet, and intellectual property issues. He advocates for the public interest before courts and policymakers and works to make sure that all stakeholders, including ordinary citizens, artists, and technological innovators, have a say in shaping emerging digital policies. Please welcome John Bergmeier. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So there's been some talk recently about internet service providers negotiating directly with streaming services to allow subscribers to stream content without it counting against their data caps, a practice known as zero rating. Comcast's version of this is called Stream TV. At the same time, the FCC passed a set of net neutrality rules last year that mandate no blocking, throttling, or paid prioritization of content. The rules are currently being litigated in the D.C. Circuit. There are really no finer advocates on this issue than you and public knowledge. So, John, it's, it's a privilege having you on the show. Uh, Thank you for the uh, high compliments. So on behalf of public knowledge, you filed a complaint against Comcast over its stream TV service in early March. But I want to take a step back and give listeners a 60-second summary of what net neutrality is and how we got to where we are in the administrative process. I mean, I could just tell you that the FCC, I mean, the rules it passed, uh, it took a while, you know, uh, going back to really Michael Powell issuing his internet policy statement about an open internet. And then the FCC has gone through various regulatory permutations trying to find a a way to pass policies that protect an open internet that uh, legally could stick. Uh, the most recent iteration involved the FCC relying on its uh, Title II broadband authority, which was a, a controversial move to say the least. But nevertheless, uh, public knowledge at least believes that uh, the FCC has finally picked a legal basis for net neutrality rules uh, that is likely to withstand challenge. Of course, you know the court hasn't issued its decision yet, so you can never be certain. But nevertheless, we're pretty confident that the FCC has finally picked a way to pass open internet rules uh, that uh, will will uh, stick legally. I think the the key, though, with uh, zero rating and the current controversy over stream TV and and the the complaint that we filed is that the FCC kind of expressly declined to really rule one way or the other on whether or not zero rating was okay. 
Um, the rules that you mentioned on blocking and throttling, those are pretty clear cut and there's some controversies over, over even those. But the FCC also did pass what's called the Internet Conduct Rule or the General Conduct Rule, which is supposed to basically say, well, on a case-by-case basis, if there's behavior that we think undermines the purpose of these rules or in some way harms competition or harms consumers, uh, you know, we, we maintain that we have the authority uh, to act against that. So I think the the question that a lot of people have is, well, does zero rating per se run against the general conduct rule? Uh, does the stream TV service uh, in particular run against the general conduct rule? And I think it's also important to note that public knowledge, although we argued that the zero rating of stream TV by Comcast violates uh, is inconsistent with the general conduct rule. With Comcast, you have a different hook, which is that they're subject to a consent decree and merger conditions uh, based on their merger with Comcast NBCU. And I think that it that uh, is very clear that zero rating is not allowed under the terms of that specific uh, consent decree. So our complaint is primarily saying that the uh, this behavior violates the consent decree and also, by the way, it would violate the open internet rules, although we didn't file a formal complaint under those rules. So how long has Stream TV been in existence? Did it exist prior to the commission's passage of the net neutrality rules? Uh, it did, Stream TV itself uh, did not. Uh, maybe Comcast was planning it, but Comcast has engaged in similar behavior before. Um, where it has zero rated its own video services on different apps and different platforms. And in fact, in uh, 2011, Public Knowledge filed a similar complaint about a different zero rating practice uh, against Comcast about how it was zero rating the video that was traveling to its Xfinity app uh, that was available on platforms like the Xbox. Uh, one, there's, there's a couple important differences, though, uh, Number one, then the net neutrality rules, of course, were different in in 2011. But also, the Xfinity app was only available to Comcast cable television subscribers, while Stream TV is a standalone service. It's offered by Comcast, so it's not like they're zero rating. You know, they're going out and like charging Netflix or something. They're zero rating their own service, which I think actually enhances the competitive harm. Uh, and also, Stream TV is available without needing a cable TV subscription at all, so it's not tied to cable TV anymore. It's just a purely, I would argue, it is purely an online service or an internet service. So when you say they're zero rating their own service, can you describe how Stream TV and other zero rating services work? Yeah, sure. So it depends first on having uh, data caps. Uh, or some sort of limitation on the amount of data that a person can consume uh, in a month. And then zero rating means instead of giving special treatment to a particular video service on a technological level, uh, where you know a particular service you know gets boosted somehow over other services or other services are throttled and so on and so forth. And those uh, particular kinds of technical interference are really what the net neutrality rules are focused on. Stream t- uh, zero rating would work through billing. So where the meter is running on your monthly data allotment, if you're watching any other video service, it wouldn't be running for for zero rated services. So the concern is that it's discrimination in favor of a particular service. Uh, and I'm not I'm just using that word objectively because I think even if you think it should be legal, it still counts as discrimination if you're treating a particular service uh, in a different way as for billing. Uh, and the concern is that, and there's evidence to suggest that when particular services don't count against people's data caps and other services do, people will tend to use the services that don't count uh, against their data caps. So... Uh, zero rating has been sort of rolled out in a number of different ways according to um, along a number of different platforms. For instance, T-Mobile on its wireless network zero rates a lot of music services. It doesn't charge the music services to be zero rated and it's sort of opened up the music freedom program that it has to a number of other services. But nevertheless, you know, you could still complain that, you know, services that are zero rated get a, an advantage over ones that aren't. With Comcast, though, it's not like they're opening up their network to any similar video service that meets certain technical requirements to be zero rated. Instead, they're just uh, applying this uh, zero rating only to their own video service, which certainly, I think, puts uh, any competing online video service at a disadvantage. So we all know classifications, how the FCC classifies different services are everything when it comes to communications policy, particularly net neutrality. What are the potential classifications for stream TV? How is each classification defined and how important are these classifications in determining whether stream TV breaks the law? 
Sure. Yeah. Obviously, this is a, a very central concern over uh, over how you think about stream TV. So, in the now overturned FCC Open Internet rules from a few years ago, there was this exemption for specialized services or managed services. Uh, and in the current uh, open internet rules, there's this notion that you can have a non-broadband service. So what does that mean? It basically means, like, of course, it is possible to offer a service, even if even a service that is available over the same wire as broadband, but nevertheless, it's not part of your broadband service. So an example of a non-broadband service to me would just be cable television. You know, cable television doesn't count against your data cap on the internet, but it's a separate service. It's available standalone. It actually is, it precedes broadband internet access. So there's a lot of reasons to say, okay, uh, obviously cable television is simply a non-broadband service. And that should apply even if the service, which is a non-broadband service, uses some technologies that are similar to internet service. So for example, AT&T on its wireline network, it has Uverse TV, which is basically a cable TV service, I would argue. Uh, in any event, though, it uses IP, so it's an IP TV service, but still, it's available standalone. It's not a broadband service. It just comes over the same wire. It uses some similar technologies, but it's clearly a standalone service. So the question is, is Stream TV a service? First, I think the first question is, is Stream TV a service that is like that, or is Stream TV s- service more similar to a typical internet service that you access over broadband, such as you know just going to Amazon.com or or using Skype, like you and I are using right now. And I think that Stream TV is much more similar to a service like Skype or Amazon.com or Netflix than it is like a service like Uverse or cable television or, or even just traditional voice telephony uh, for the following reason. Stream TV is only available over broadband. You can only use streaming uh, Stream TV. Uh, it, it comes in over your cable modem. You access it on your typical broadband devices, like a uh, like a laptop or a mobile device, and you can only access it if you subscribe to broadband. So, in every uh, pertinent respect, I would argue Stream TV is similar to a uh, an online service and not similar to. Uh, a non-broadband service. Now, Comcast disagrees because they would argue that even though it is available only over your broadband connection, um, it's 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 a service that is run and managed by them. So they would say it's coming in over a private network, uh, and it is not part of what they would call the public internet. So I think that is the first classification battle. Uh, obviously, I think my position is right, but you know, Comcast does have an argument on the other side. Um, and there is another classification uh, to be had, which is whether or not Stream TV is itself an MVPD service. And then I'm sure a lot of your listeners know this, but an MVPD is a multi-channel video programming distributor, and it's the broad regulatory classification that includes things like cable TV and satellite TV, just you know the the the, the pay TV services that people tend to be familiar with. And Comcast would argue that well, whether or not it's uh, part of uh, it's a non-broadband service. You know, the fact that it is basically just a an alternative to cable means that you should treat it just like cable. And if cable doesn't violate net neutrality, then then why should stream TV? Uh, I think there's a couple problems with that argument. One, I don't think that stream TV fits the FCC's current definition of what a multi-channel video programming distributor is, because the FCC was considering opening up that definition to allow online services uh, to to qualify and it chose not to do that or at least not yet so therefore under the definition that comcast is subject to i don't think stream tv counts but then second uh you know when the justice department adopted a very clear condition against comcast favoring its own traffic with regard to how it counts uh services for billing purposes it used a very broad term affiliated network traffic and i think that term is so broad that it doesn't allow for Comcast to say, well, because it belongs to this category and not that category, therefore it's okay. I think the DOJ was very concerned that Comcast, after buying Comcast NBC, would be able to leverage its uh, control over the distribution pipeline, its control over a lot of content, you know, through its ownership of NBC Universal, and it would be able to take various uh, steps to interfere with the development of a competitive online video marketplace. I think that is exactly what Comcast is doing now. 
And that's why I think that there are various attempts to say that, you know, because stream TV fits into this definition or that definition, I don't think that works under the, uh, under the consent decree and under the, uh, the merger language that the FCC adopted. So now that the FCC has your complaint and public knowledge's complaint, how's the FCC going to assess Comcast's compliance with the net neutrality rules? There are several factors. Can you tell us what those factors are, how they're defined and how they apply in this case? Sure. So I think, um, because we filed this, we we basically filed a comment in the merger docket saying that we think that Comcast's current behavior is inconsistent with uh, the the order that granted Comcast's uh, merger with Comcast with NBCU. Uh, when, when it comes to merger conditions, there isn't necessarily a clear process whereby third parties can come in and file a complaint and then like trigger certain compliance where, for example, we filed something and Comcast has X number of days to file a response and so on. That doesn't really work uh, in the merger condition context. So we certainly hope that the FCC looks at our complaint, takes it very seriously, perhaps asks Comcast to respond. And if the FCC believes that we're right, that they would take appropriate action. Like I said, we did not file this as a net neutrality complaint per se, which does have a a pretty clear procedure for people to come in and file uh, complaints that trigger particular you know, necessary responses. Uh, that was more of a strategic call because we think that although their behavior is inconsistent with the net neutrality rules, we also think it's important to enforce uh, specific merger conditions. So we wanted to sort of put that argument first while sort of keeping the net neutrality argument in our back pocket, as it were. So even so, though you, you filed it, even though you filed, even though you included net neutrality as an argument, you didn't have to file it in the, in the net neutrality docket as well? You know, we did file it in the net neutrality docket, but we, we did not style it as a net neutrality complaint. And in fact, in a footnote, we, we, we tried to be pretty clear that we did not intend this to be a formal net neutrality complaint. However, I think it would look odd if we sort of put forward this argument without addressing the net neutrality issue, uh, in part because it's an issue of such high public importance, for example. So when we filed our earlier complaint uh, about the Xbox, which, which was factually different, we, we just didn't address net neutrality arguments at all and focused our complaint entirely on the merger conditions. Uh, We thought this time around it was important to address the issue so people know at least where we stand on the uh, issue of whether or not it violates uh, the open internet rules. And now the general conduct rule, it's pretty broad. Um, but the FCC enumerates a number of factors to consider as to whether or not a particular service would run afoul of the open internet rule. And we sort of walked through the factors. For example, what is the effect of on competition? Is it a technically neutral provision? Uh, things like that. And we think that uh, in each case, uh, Stream TV runs afoul of the factors that the FCC said it would consider when determining whether a service violates the open internet uh, rule. And I also think that surely an analysis of how a particular service would fare under a pure net neutrality uh, analysis should inform how the FCC enforces the merger conditions that are on Comcast specifically because those merger conditions were specifically crafted to complement the open internet rules as opposed to you know just to be an entire substitute for them so the policy issues in a lot of in a lot of senses overlap it's been several years now that consumers have been using Netflix and other streaming services, John. How accustomed have we become to streaming content using those platforms directly? How much of a threat is Stream TV? And wouldn't this sudden change be too complicated to be bothered with making consumers more likely to keep accessing stream content the same way they've always been accessing it? Well, I do think it is true that consumers are have uh, taken to online video to a degree which I think uh, exceeds what a lot of people would have predicted some years ago. Uh, you know, Netflix is very popular, Hulu is very popular, Amazon's video service is very popular. But at the same time, I think consumers uh, are pretty fickle, and they will they will switch from one online service to another if there are uh, if there are pretty clear advantages to doing so. Uh, the online video marketplace, unlike the traditional you know cable television landscape. Uh, is extremely competitive where you see a lot of investment in content and programming by these different services where they're really trying to differentiate each other for themselves because they're they're operating in an entirely different marketplace where when cable was competing with satellite TV or maybe an overbuilder or maybe a service like Fios TV, uh, pretty much they had broadly comparable programming lineups. And that's not really the case with online video uh, just because of the way the market works and the, and the legal environment they operate in. 
uh, they often have pretty different catalogs from each other. So on the one hand, uh, sometimes you could subscribe to both. Like I subscribe to three different online video services, uh, HBO Now, Netflix, and Hulu. And there's not a ton of overlap between them. And each one sort of brings something unique uh, that the other ones don't offer. Meanwhile, you know, you'd be kind of crazy to subscribe to both cable TV and satellite TV because it would just be uh, duplicative. Uh, but at the same time... Uh, I think there is a lot of competition and there's some people that want to pick just one and only one service. So, you know, if people want to abandon Netflix in favor of, say, stream TV, I don't think there's much reason for them, uh, you know, for them not to. I don't think there's a lot of lock in with these online video services like there is, uh, you know, with other with other kinds of uh, communication services like uh, cable TV. So, well, John, this is a fascinating topic, and we could go on for hours, but we're hitting our cap here, so to speak. So hmm. thanks once again for joining me. And I, I just wanted to ask you a few more questions, and then we'll close. Sound like a plan? Sure. sure. All right. On this podcast, we like to talk about policy, but also about what makes successful people like you tick. Tell us, John, what are some habits, tactics, and apps that you use every day to stay on top of your game? Yeah, so I, I, apps is easier to answer than tactics because I can be pretty specific. I've really taken to these uh, email uh, apps recently that allow you to snooze emails. So they sort of remove from your inbox and then they come back at a predetermined time. Uh, I find that very convenient as a way to sort of triage the massive amount of incoming email I get all the time. Uh, so I use uh, Google Inbox right now. Uh, there's other popular services that do this, like uh, Reattle's app Spark does it. Uh, Dropbox actually innovated in this space with an app called Mailbox. Unfortunately, it's recently shut down. Uh, but this notion of taking emails and just snoozing them for later uh, has really caught on with a lot of apps. And I just find that just enormously convenient uh, for sort of keeping track of uh, my communications. So that's the one I'd recommend uh, that, that people check out if they, haven't, if they haven't already. Tell us the name of a book, John, that you read recently that you're recommending to basically everyone you meet. Yeah, so uh, I, I actually have two. I'm cheating. But one is a book called The Comedians by Cliff Nesteroff. Uh, and his name is weird, uh, spelled weird, but it's uh, K L I P H N E S T E R O F F, I believe. Um, and it's just really a history of of comedy throughout the 20th century, and it's fascinating because it traces. Uh, it starts with vaudeville, it goes through radio, TV, all the way up to podcasting, and tells a lot of interesting showbiz stories for people who are interested in how the media marketplace works. It gives a lot of insight to that. So that book came out pretty recently, and uh, and I think it's great. Um, and then every intern that comes through public knowledge, I recommend a book called The Deal of the Century by Steve Cole, which is just a narrative account of the breakup of uh, AT&T, which uh, if you're interested in this, the uh, communications marketplace is probably the most important event. And, uh, and it really teaches you a lot about how DC works and how the communications marketplace works. So I think those would be my two recommendations. Yeah, because the way DC doesn't work definitely is on comedy. So people... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I wanted to have two because I didn't want to only recommend the boring policy book or the one that is uh, a little less on, on point with uh, the public policy issues. But thanks again, John, for joining me. And do you have any final ideas you'd like to leave with the audience before we close? And where can folks find you online? Well, uh, you, they can find me online. I'm um, at Bergmeyer on Twitter, uh, B-E-R-G-M-A-Y-E-R. -E -E and, you know, I blog and write for public knowledge at publicknowledge.org. And for final ideas, I recommend that people just follow what has been happening in the video marketplace recently. The video marketplace has taken a lot longer to adapt to new technologies than, say, the music industry or the publishing industry or the news industry. But I think it is finally starting to change. I think you're finally starting to see the emergence of more choice for consumers, which is definitely good, more outlets for creators, which is definitely good. But at the same time, the incumbents who benefit from the current system are certainly aware of the changes and they're working to make sure that they stay dominant in the future. So I think the video marketplace is just a fascinating place to watch. And I would recommend that anyone who is interested in communications policy, maybe uh, really focus on that because it is the area where I think we're going to see the most change in the next five to 10 years. And you've been listening to John Bergmeier. John is a senior staff attorney at Public Knowledge, specializing in telecommunications, internet, and intellectual property issues. He advocates for the public interest before courts and policymakers and works to make sure that all stakeholders, including ordinary citizens, artists, and technological innovators, have a say in what's shaping emerging digital policies. John, thanks for joining me. 
Thank you for having me. That concludes episode 31 of the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. I cannot do any of this without you, so thank you. If you're new to the podcast or even if you've been listening for a while, I invite you to subscribe to the weekly Data Points newsletter, which is a summary of relevant communications and media-related research that's been done recently, as well as related socioeconomic research. You can find the sign-up for that at the top of the page at washingtech.com. Thanks again to all of you for listening, and I will see you back here next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed. 